Good morning and welcome to our worship service today. At this point, if you would like to, you may take off your face mask and uh, I will remind you to stay in your seat now that the service has begun. If there's an emergency and you do have to get up, we ask that you put your face mask back on and give the people around you or the people you might be walking by a chance to put theirs on as well. I'm Alan Akana, the Kahu or pastor of Koloa Union Church, and I welcome everyone who's here today at our worship service. It's good to see everybody, and thank you for socially distancing and for wearing your face masks and doing all the right things. I really appreciate it all. Because of that, we're able to worship, and um, we do know that there's a lot of the virus being spread in other parts of the state, and uh, our church uh, leadership is just determined to do our very best to keep everything and everyone as safe as possible. So thank you for understanding our guidelines. And I will point out at the top of page six, I believe it is, or the top of page five are the guidelines for the worship service. Um, if there are any first time guests that are visiting with us today, I invite you to fill out a visitor card and we also have a gift for you. Um, and for people that are arriving, um, there's a couple spots left, and we also have room out back and in Moore Hall. Also, uh, just as a reminder, our offerings, we're, we don't collect an offering during the pandemic. Instead, you can drop off your offering in the baskets in the front, um, outside, or up here afterwards, and we really appreciate all the gifts that we've been receiving during this time. And now, speaking of gifts, um, I think everybody has in your bulletin the Strengthen the Church offering insert, and there's also, I think on the top of page six, a uh, dis description and um, yeah, gives you a little bit of an understanding of what this is all about. Those of you that have been around for a while know all about Strengthen the Church. It's usually taken on Pentecost. Uh, and this year, Pentecost was May 31st, and because of another special crisis that was going on at the time, we decided to collect, collect another Christmas offering to help retired pastors, retired church workers that were really struggling, and then to take the Strength in the Church offering later in the summer. So today's the day we're collecting the offering, and if you've forgotten, uh, feel free, just uh, write a check to Koloa Union Church. Um, with uh, Strength in the Church or STC in the memo line, and you can send it in in the next couple of weeks. And um, for those of you that are, are here today, feel free to use the envelope. And Strength in the Church is one of the four denominational offerings that we collect every year. And the Strength in the Church offering helps congregations just like ours with new ideas, with youth ministry, and all sorts of... Um, things that churches can do that need a little extra help doing some of those things. And I have a feeling we're going to be applying for a grant in the next year or two. So by committing to um, supporting the Strength in the Church offering denominationally, you're actually helping every single church. One thing I wanted to point out in here is, um, I, I think it's on the front page, yep, right in the middle, it talks about the National Youth Event and how Strength in the Church offering has helped students that are typically in high school get to an event we have every four years. This year it was supposed to be in July, just this last month, a couple of weeks ago I think, at Purdue University and it had to be canceled because of the pandemic and so they're doing some online things with our youth and also planning um, on doing this in a couple of years from now once it's safe to gather again. We did have, I think it was four teenagers from this island who had signed up and over a dozen on Oahu and other um, islands. My guess is we probably would have had 15 to 20 just from Hawaii fly from the islands to um, Indiana and uh, be with other teenagers that are also members of UCC churches. And I've been a part of groups like this before and it's life changing. And, and so I just want you to know when you support the strength in the church, you're supporting all different ages and it, it really makes a difference. And so I invite you to do that today whatever you can give over and above your offering to the, um, the church's general fund. I believe that's it for our announcements today. And I, I just wanted to kind of set the tone for today's worship service. We're going to be looking at the parable, not the parable, the story of Jesus feeding the crowd of 5,000. And there was actually probably closer to 20,000 or more that we're guessing because it was 5,000 men 
and women, in addition to women and children. And so I just figured, well, I had to be at least 20, maybe 25,000 in this huge crowd. And one of the things that I want to talk about today that we often just gloss over whenever we talk about this miraculous event is the incredible grief that was happening at that time. And I'll be sharing a bit about that in my message. But this was a day of incredible grief. And as I've been paying attention to some of you and people in the community and family and friends, we've all been experiencing a lot of grief in our lives. Our nation has been grieving, the world has been grieving, and I would like for you, before um, Rosemary comes up for the call to worship, just to close your eyes for a second and just think about the grief that perhaps you have experienced your loved ones, and it could be the, the loss of a loved one, or it could just be the grief of planning on seeing somebody that you now can't see. But sit with that for just a moment, the grief that is all around us, and imagine God's loving presence being right there in the middle of whatever grief you might be experiencing. Today's Kavehiana Ikapule, today's call to worship, is adapted from Psalm 145. Let us worship God, the one who reigns over creation, and bless the name of the Lord forever and ever. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. God's greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and shows compassion to all that God has made. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord is just in every way and kind in every action. God is near to all who call upon the name of the Lord, to all who call on God in truth. The Lord fulfills the desires of all who fear the Holy One. God hears their cry and saves them. Let our mouths speak praise of the Lord, and may all creation bless God's holy name forever and ever. Today's opening prayer is also adapted from Psalm 145. Let us pray. O God, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, we will meditate. We will proclaim your awesome deeds and declare your greatness. We will celebrate your abundant goodness and sing aloud of your righteousness. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. We will speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, for your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. We look to you to provide food in season, for you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Amen.
Today's Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 to 3 and 6 to 12. Listen for the word of God. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the riches of fare. Give ear and come to me, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promise to David. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, I do not return to it without watering the earth and making its bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which it was sent. I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Today's gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Listen for the word of God. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to the heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. May God bless the reading of the word, and may our hearts be open to receiving it. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 in the crowd, which I mentioned earlier, was probably closer to 20 to 25,000, is one of the most popular stories of Jesus in the Gospels. It's one of those feel-good stories where you can read and say, isn't that just wonderful? People needed to be healed, and so Jesus healed them, and then they were hungry, and Jesus fed them all, all thousands of them, and everyone who showed up ill or injured and hungry went away, completely healed and well-fed. I have heard this story told countless times, and I've heard many messages or sermons about the story. But it wasn't until this time where I tried to read it in all of its context where it occurred to me that this was probably the saddest day in Jesus' life, at least up until that point. 
the text begins with the words, when Jesus had heard this, and all of a sudden it occurred to me that Jesus had just heard something, and therefore all of this story happens. And so, of course, I had to go back and read, what did Jesus just hear? He just heard that John the Baptist had died. He had been murdered. He had actually been decapitated. And John's disciples had just arrived to share with Jesus this sad, sad news. As I was looking at the story of the feeding of the 5,000, I thought, I've got to go back and read more about John and just see what kind of impact that news must have had on Jesus. And so I went back to Matthew chapter 3 and learned that John the Baptist had been going out into the wilderness and doing his thing out there, and people from all over, from Jerusalem and all over Judea, were going out to see John, to listen to him, to confess their sins, and hear his words, which were, repent, for the empire of God is at hand. So you've got all these people showing up out in the desert, and if we're going to really understand what the message is all about, we have to understand it in the context of the people that lived in the day of Jesus, and also in the context of the people that were reading Matthew's gospel for the first time. When we hear the word repent, those of us that, at least I think most of us, who have grown up in Western civilization and have either grown up in the church or have attended church for a while, we think of the word repent in a very personal, individualistic sort of way. And we also tend to think of it in terms of specific actions, a list of do's and don'ts. You repent by doing all, or stop doing all the things that are on the, the don't list and then doing all the things that are on the do list. Did I get that backwards? But anyway, you know what I mean. So, the, the idea, though, is we tend to think of it as, oh, my goodness, there are specific things that I, have, as an individual, need to stop doing or start doing. However, repent in the Jewish mindset of the time had just as much to do with community and with society as it had to do with individuals. And Matthew already, this early in the gospel, is setting up this theme that I've talked about so many times before, where you've got the empire of, of Rome, the Roman Empire on the one hand, and Jesus comes along and has this message, which he calls the empire of heaven, which is the opposite, basically, of the Roman Empire. But even before Jesus... John was preaching about the Roman Empire. And sometimes people say, Kahu, don't talk about politics in church. Jesus would never do that. And I just want you to know, that's almost all he talked about. Jesus was always saying, here's what the world can be like. Here's what it's like. Here's what it's going to take to change. And some of that, of course, has to do with the individual. But a lot of it has to do with community and society. So repent, the word is metanoia in Greek, which basically means over the mind. In other words, it has to do with changing your mind and your heart and your perceptions of the world as it is. So when people would leave Jerusalem and go out to the desert, into the wilderness, to the Jordan River, just to be with John, when he said repent, for the empire of heaven is at hand, he was basically saying, change your perception, change your mind and your heart, and don't focus so much on what the world is like right now because it is awful. Instead, have this vision, this dream of what this empire that God's in charge of might look like, and then start changing things. So repent had to do with society, 
with community as well as individuals. It also had to do with changing from within. It's not really about, oh, there's a list of sins. Let's just not do all of those things so we can check those off and go to heaven. It's really all about changing the way you see the world and all of its possibilities and walking in that direction. So there's repent. There's also confess. And again, in our society, when we think of confess, we go back to those sins that we think we're not supposed to do and we confess those sins. But again, in that time, to confess simply meant to admit. And John was talking, again, just as much about society and community as he was about confessing personal individual sins. You've got the Roman Empire out there. And what was wrong with it? Well, it was so clear at the time to John and Jesus and everybody else that a very, very small percentage of people enjoyed almost all of the wealth and all of the power and carried uh, along with that all the privileges that they had because of that. And the, the vast amount of people, the masses of people, barely got by from day to day. There was incredible poverty at the time. Most people were hungry every single day. And health care, unless you were part of that elite group, was virtually non-existent. So John was inviting people to confess being a part of that so that they could actually say, we want something different. And then baptism. Again, we think of baptism, I think, in Western society as an individual thing that you do so you go to heaven when you die. Or perhaps you do for your children, so if your children die, or when your children die, they will go to heaven. But again, back in those days, baptism had just as much to do with society and community as it did with individuals. In fact, when people went out to be baptized in the Jordan River by John, he wasn't focusing on, okay, what are all the little sins that you've done or the big ones in your life? Check, 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 check. Okay, you're baptized, now you go to heaven. It, baptism for John was basically saying, I publicly renounce the Roman Empire. See how dangerous that is? I publicly am stating that's wrong. That's not of God. This empire is not God's plan and God's will for the world. And by being baptized, I'm saying that. I'm also saying I'm part of this new plan. I'm part of a plan where justice and equality and goodness for all people and compassion is the norm. And people showed up for that message, probably by the thousands. But you know, it's interesting that John didn't baptize everybody who showed up. And it's clear in today's, uh, or in um, Matthew chapter 3, that when people showed up who were called Pharisees or Sadducees, he basically said, I I'm not going to baptize you because I know you don't mean it. He actually called them a brood of vipers. I mean, how much more clear could you be that you're not here for the right reason? So basically, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were the Jewish people of privilege. Besides the governor, King Herod, the chief priest, it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees that enjoyed most of the privileges of the land because they supported the empire. You got that? And so John basically said, what you guys are trying to do is keep one foot in the Roman Empire so you can enjoy all the privileges and benefits and all the wealth and power that the emperor gives you. And because you're realizing that things are changing, you want to put the other foot in this new empire of heaven or empire of God because you want all those same privileges once everything changes. And John basically is saying to them, you can't have it both ways. You either support the unjust empire or you say, it's time for a change, and I am going to be a part of the change. 
And so the Pharisees and Sadducees, many of them, I'm sure, just said, well, then we're not going to get baptized. And that was their choice. So King Herod, oh, be, before, before I even get to Herod, when the people are there getting baptized, John the Baptist actually refers to Jesus without naming him. He says, there's one that's coming after me that will, I, I baptize with water, but this one coming after me will baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. In other words, I'm just preparing the way for something even greater. There's somebody that's about to come that is powerful because of the authority given to this person by God. This person is in the line of the prophets. This person cares about justice. This person cares about compassion. This person cares about people, not just the privileged, but for all people. And those of us that have read the story know that he's talking about Jesus, but if you'd never heard the story for the first time, all of a sudden, guess what happens next? Jesus shows up and wants to be baptized. Now, in Matthew 3 and 4, you can read all about this, but Jesus basically, it tells us in Matthew, he traveled from Nazareth all the way to the wilderness. So from Nazareth to Jerusalem is about 90 miles. And we don't know where in the wilderness John was actually baptizing along the Jordan River, but my guess is Jesus walked about 100 miles to be baptized. And what Matthew is doing here in this context is distinguishing and contrasting the brood of vipers, the privileged people that all they really cared about was keeping their privilege, and doing it in a nice religious way, by the way. So Matthew was contrasting them with Jesus, who was willing to walk a hundred miles to publicly state, here's what's wrong with the Roman Empire. Here are the things that we have to take a stand on and say, it's just wrong. And here are the possibilities of love, of compassion, of grace for everyone. You see, in this new way of being, nobody has more privilege than anybody else. Truly, all are equal. And so, John realizes how great Jesus is, and he goes, I, I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. You're the one I was just talking about. And Jesus basically just said, John, trust me, it's the right thing to do. So, John baptizes Jesus, and then we know the story. The heavens open up, the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove, a dove and a voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Here we have the Holy Trinity in its fullness, claiming that Jesus is God's representative. This is the one you're supposed to listen to, not the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the drama even builds much more. In today's lesson, the reading that Rosemary just read for us in Matthew 14, Jesus just found out that John was murdered by King Herod. Now, a little bit of background there. Herod hated John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist spoke the truth, and he wasn't afraid to speak the truth. And the truth was that he spoke that Herod couldn't stand. For the sake of power, Herod married a woman that was already married. Her name was Herodias. I have a feeling she changed her name after marrying Herod. But anyway, she was married to Philip, Herod's brother. So John the Baptist is basically saying, I don't care if you're in charge of this country. The rules apply to you too, buddy. You are just as accountable as all the rest of us. In fact, you should be following the rules and setting the example for all the rest of us. And King Herod had John arrested. It's kind of like, well, I know how to silence him. Let's just throw him in jail. And as far as we know, John sat in jail, in prison, for most of Jesus' ministry until he was killed. And the reason he was killed is because there was somebody that hated John even more than Herod, and it was his wife, Herodias. How dare John tell me I shouldn't be married to this guy, even though I'm also married to his brother? How dare he 
meddle in politics. He should keep to religion, which is where he belongs. But John just said, it's, it's, all, it's all part of the same package, folks. And so Herodias forced John's hand to basically cut off John the Baptist's head. And Herodias was presented John the Baptist's head on a platter by their daughter. John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, took the body, buried it, and then immediately went and told Jesus. And that's where today's story picks up. Do you see how looking a little bit of context can totally shift how you're seeing a story? How you are understanding a story and what that story was really like for the people that were there? This was the saddest day of Jesus' life. Jesus was grieving. You see, John the Baptist was Jesus' mentor. In fact, we learn in Matthew chapter 4 that when John went to prison, Jesus moved from Nazareth to Capernaum on the very north, the northern slopes of the Sea of Galilee, and he began preaching the exact same words as John the Baptist, repent, for the empire of God has drawn near. So you see, John the Baptist was not only Jesus' mentor who baptized him on the day that the most incredible spiritual experience that Jesus could imagine happened. The heavens opened up, the Holy Spirit came down, God actually said, this is my beloved son in whom I, who I am well pleased. Jesus loved John the Baptist. He was his mentor. He was his friend. He actually got Jesus pointed in the right direction, and they shared the same message. The two of them were going to change the world together. They somehow were going to figure out how to overcome the Roman Empire. Who knew how they were going to do it? But that's what John the Baptist meant to Jesus, and now John is dead. He's been beheaded by Herod for speaking the same message that Jesus was speaking. And Jesus must have wondered, when is my turn? I'm obviously next. How much time do I have to change the world before Herod gets me? This is what was going on in Jesus' head for sure when today's passage begins in Matthew 14. And so we know that Jesus had gone to a lonely place to be alone with God. And can you blame him? Imagine the interruption when 25,000 people or so showed up and said, heal us all. Jesus was just trying to figure out, how do I get through this time of grief? This is awful. And furthermore, Herod's coming after me next. And Jesus could have seen this interruption as simply that. You know, there's a bunch of annoying people out there. I'm grieving, I'm scared, I'm going to stay in my lonely place. But we know what Jesus did. He spent the entire day until evening healing people, helping people. He had the gift of healing, and people needed healing, so that's where he went. Jesus healed them until it was time to eat. So as the sun was setting, everybody was hungry, everybody was tired, and Jesus told his disciples, you feed them. I mean, they pointed out, everyone's hungry. Let's send them on their way so we can go eat. And Jesus said, no, you feed them. You feed 25 to whatever, 1,000 people. And his disciples thought he was crazy. Anybody would have th thought he was crazy. Like, we don't have all this food. Look at this crowd. I mean, this is like a small town. I, it's like, we can't feed everybody. And Jesus basically took the loaves and the fishes, and he blessed them and told his disciples, share this little bit of food with everybody. Just see how far it goes. And by the end of the meal, everybody was stuffed. And there was more food left over than what they began with. And I, of course, have heard this story many times, and I've always thought, wow, what a miracle that you can have such little 
And yet, because you give it away in love, it expands. It grows because of the compassion that you have that goes into the gift. Isn't that wonderful? But I think after reading the whole story in context today, there's another message that's even deeper for me, and it's this. Jesus needed time alone with God. Jesus was grieving. Jesus was certainly afraid and probably feeling anxious. I know some of you think that Jesus never had any fear or anxiety, but imagine if you were him. Imagine if your mentor, the person you were going to change the world with, the person who loved you and was there at the most significant time of your life, was beheaded because of the message you both were sharing with the world. Wouldn't you be afraid? Wouldn't you be anxious? Jesus knew that he wanted just to be alone, and yet there were people with needs all over, all around him, and because he had what it took to give them what they needed, he found the strength to help those people all around him. And to me, that is the greatest miracle. When someone is grieving, when someone just feels completely drained from, of energy from the grief, when somebody is afraid and anxious, and yet they can still stand up, walk out the door, and say, I can bless you as well, even in this state of grief. And the reason I wanted to share this part of the story with you today is I keep hearing about grief during this pandemic. Some of you know loved ones and dear friends who have actually died from the pandemic. Some of you have very close friends and loved ones who have gotten sick and might even still be sick. Some of you have had people that you love dearly die and you couldn't be with them on their deathbed because those are the rules right now. And when there was a little tiny funeral with a minister, you couldn't be there because just part of the new rules right now. And we all know somebody who's lost their job or their only source of income and they're wondering this week, is the government going to help out? Will there be any money to pay rent this week? And the people that own those homes that the people are paying and that are renting are saying, oh my gosh, I can't pay the bank if I don't get rent. People are grieving in so many, many different ways. And as I look around the congregation, I know many of you have experienced grief. And some of that grief is huge. And I look at just this morning, I was thinking, oh, my niece was going to come in July. She's not coming. My nephew was going to come. He's not coming. My sister's supposed to come in a couple months. I don't know if she's coming. It's like this is the first year that I've had months without any visitors that are my immediate family. And even though I'm not crying about it, there is a sense of loss. I'm just thinking, I'm not used to just being by myself all the time and not being, have, not being able to have family come and visit regularly or for me to go. I, I'm typically in California three or four times a year, and that's my time to be with family and friends over there. So I know that my grief isn't nearly as immense as many others, but my guess is we can all say there's some grief. We're all feeling something that doesn't feel good, and there's some anxiety, and there's some fear. But the miracle for us is the same miracle of Matthew 14. Even in our grief, even in our fear, even in our anxiety, no matter how deep it is, we still have gifts that we can give to other people. We still have the ability to show compassion we still have ability to do something. And just like Jesus was absolutely devastated, he stood up and he walked out and he healed people all day. I also want to tell you, please give yourself permission to grieve. Jesus actually is our example in that. He went to that alone place. Everybody found him. He spent half a day or a day, whatever, healing people and then feeding people. And then, as the story tells us, 
he went back to his alone place. We don't know if it was the same place or not, but he knew he needed time alone with God for prayer and just probably to cry and to ask why and what's next and what am I supposed to do? All the prayers that we often say when we find ourselves in that kind of a situation. Yes, take that time to grieve. Do what it takes for the healing and be aware. If, if your grief is anything like mine it, mine, it comes in waves. It's like all of a sudden it just hits me and it's like, oh my gosh, yes. And then the wave recedes for a while, then it comes back again. And you don't know really when that wave of grief is going to hit. But I beg you, I implore you, take the time that you need to grieve and do whatever it takes for that healing process. And we all heal in different ways. But don't ever think for a moment that because of your grief or your, or your fear or, or your anxiety that you no longer have anything to give anyone else. Simply calling somebody on the phone just to check in is a really good thing to do. Now, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because I keep thinking, wow, how many face masks did we make over the last four months? That is miraculous. And I, I was thinking about last week when a bunch of us showed up at St. Raphael's and we basically just spent hours packing food into grocery bags so that over 100 people on the South Shore would have something to eat this week or last week. Well, actually, probably for several weeks. There was a lot of food we stuffed in those bags. And then I was remembering a, a photo I saw from, I think it was Amber, at the back of their pickup truck. It was just loaded with things that the Women in Needs organization needed, women in need here on Kauai, who basically provide assistance and shelters for women who have been abused. And I could probably go on and on, especially if I asked you, how, how have you seen people showing compassion in the midst of grief, in the, mix, in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of fear? I think we've all participated and observed many, many examples of that. So like I said, Jesus could have said, ah, an interruption, let me grieve. But instead he said an opportunity. There's something I can do at this moment. It's not for the rest of my life. It was just for part of a day. But he went and provided something that people needed. And I'm guessing he did it with some joy and a, a feeling of accomplishment, of, of meaning. And so the message to you today, in the midst of your grief and your fear and your anxiety and whatever else might come upon you in the weeks to come, Continue asking God, what are the gifts that you've given me that I might be able to share with somebody around me that could truly benefit from one of those gifts? For you see, this world, this empire of heaven that John the Baptist and Jesus spoke of, it begins with acts of compassion to individual people. And when enough people do that, not only does transformation happen in their lives, but societies are transformed. And when enough societies are transformed, the nations are transformed. And when enough nations are transformed, the world truly is transformed. And it begins with each and every one of us. So recognize your grief. Be alone if you need to. Be with others if you need to. Cry if you need to. But be open to the possibility that there's something God has given you today that you could share with somebody else. Amen. So now it's time for the prayers of the people, and uh, thank you for the prayer card, Steve. I'll point out on um, page 7, we have um, the prayers that we've been asking people to pray for during the week, and here are some new ones for Sandy... Looks like Sandy Margo undergoing treatment for brain cancer. And Auntie Moile, or Miley Duvachel um, with nodes in recent, on a recent scan, praying for new treatment to shrink the nodes. That's from Tiffany. And from Debbie, she said, I had a wonderful birthday yesterday. 
and Bonnie is having a wonderful birthday today. It's good to have you with us, Bonnie. Happy birthday. And from Rosemary, prayers for nephew Kahala, whose wife is an RN at a nursing home on Oahu who has been exposed to a coworker who has COVID-19. Prayers that their tests are negative. Prayers for Ohana on Oahu to be safe from exposure. And from Lorraine, the continued prayers for Omashar's healing. Um, in the worldwide prayer vigil tonight, oh, which is at six o'clock, I think I saw that on Facebook. And for an update on his condition, you may talk to Lorraine or check out the GoFundMe page for Omashar. And then we have another birthday. Kay's birthday is tomorrow. So happy birthday to everyone who's having birthdays this week. I now invite you to pause for just a moment. And as we begin this time of prayer, I invite you to think of some grief. It might be your own, but I also want you to think about some grief that somebody you know might be holding with them. And just hold that grief along with them. Just open your heart and say, here's somebody who's grieving. I'm going to hold their grief as well. And after just a moment, I'll lead us in prayer. Holy God, in the midst of this pandemic, we continue to experience joy and we continue to have celebrations for birthdays, for times to be together, for phone calls, for little things we often take for granted. God, we thank you for all the gifts and today as we remember through the message in Matthew chapter 14, Sometimes the great gifts of compassion come during times of grief, anxiety, and fear. And we thank you for all of the compassion that has been shown during this time. And we pray, O oh God, for places where compassion is needed now, where there is injustice, where people are suffering, where people are sick, where people are isolated, where people are fearful because of this virus. And God, we also remember the many places in our country and throughout the world where people are fearful because of violence, because people are angry and frustrated about racism and sexism and so many other isms. God, we pray that people would find helpful and peaceful ways to accomplish your will. God, we pray for all who are sick and injured, for your healing. We pray, O oh God, for those who are institutionalized and in homes where they can no longer leave. And we also remember those especially who have recently lost loved ones. O oh God, may your love be so evident, even in these trying times in which we live. And may that love especially be evident through our own love, our own compassion, our acts of compassion, and our words of compassion. And God, in closing, I ask that you place on each and every one of our hearts someone else who might be grieving, feeling anxious, and fearful. And may we do something, whatever it is, that might relieve some of the grief, the anxiety, or the fear but if nothing else, just to say, I'm here for you, I care, I love you. For God, that's how this world will change when we care for everyone just like that. We ask these things in your precious and holy name, the name of our Savior, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to invite Rose up to introduce the song, the hula that she's going to do. Aloha kakayaka kako. Kapole 
This beautiful love song to be. Our hearts are where we feel the compassion of even in the midst of struggle and grief. Dwells in tranquility. Love for you is here. For in here, love, God embraces. God is in our heart. So no matter where we are, he is right here in our heart with us. And we are loved and know love to show compassion for all, no matter what situation. Le Manoa is an original melee written by Barry Flanagan from Hapa. Before writing this melee, he consulted a Hawaiian historian, Uncle Charlie Maxwell, for the meaning of the circular clouds of beauty that mist upon Manoa, surrounding the Mauka range of Manoa near his home that he sees every dawn. It is a symbol of a ring, but Uncle Charlie noted this metaphor that the lay of rain of circle has been doing this for century, if you are not aware, and will continue to do so. A simple, a symbol of infinity, a love that is forever. Your interpretation of this hula dream is God's love is forever. Eya no ko aloha for you. Love is here. Mahalo. Eko ma ko ma ku eloko kalani. Eho ano iko inoa. E hiki mai ko aupuni. E malama ia ko maki maki maka honu ane. I like me ia i malama ia maka lanila. E havi mai a mako e ki ala i aina mako no ne i ala. E kala mai ho ia i mako i ka mako lave hala ana. Me mako e kala ne i ka poe i lave hala. Ika mako, mai hoku o ia mako ika o vale vale ia mai, e ho o pa kile nona e ia mako ika ino, no kamea, no ke aupuni, a me kamana, a me ka ho nani a mau loa aku, a mene, a mene.
Thank you so much, Rose and Doug. I felt so much love, peace, and hope in the words and also in the movement, so thank you. I now invite everyone to put your face mask back on and uh, remind you also to keep it on until you either get to your car or you're off the property. And um, as a reminder, we ask the people in the rear of the sanctuary to leave first and then uh, work your way up and I'll remain up here. And now for the benediction, may the love of God, the grace of our Savior Jesus and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen.